Well, it's one o'clock. I think it's we should just kick it off. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. My name is Ian Pike. I'm the director of the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit at BC Children's Hospital, um, and uh, which is a unit uh, responsible for monitoring trends and patterns of injury in British Columbia and uh, providing advice and recommendation to health authorities and to the government on policy and practice. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you to this webinar this afternoon on the Vision Zero in Road Safety Grant Program. There will be a number of presentations and more importantly, a question and answer period for you to better understand the program and how you may apply. Next slide, please, Neil. Before I begin, however, I would like to acknowledge that I work on the official, uh, sorry, on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Squamish, Stolo and Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam nations. Uh, but today I'm coming to you from my home, which is on the traditional territories of the Catesis people. And I ask you, uh, wherever you're dialing in from to just uh, uh, give your own acknowledgement to, to the traditional territories from which you are uh, attending. And if you wish to put that in the chat, please feel free to do so. Next slide, please, Neil. So today our webinar, um, will begin with these introductions. Um, we will follow that with a presentation by Mr. Neil Arison from the BC Ministry of Health. Neil has been the champion of this uh, grant program and uh, he's going to provide us with a presentation on the Vision Zero principles and how this grant program is intended to support those very important principles. Following that, there will be um, a panel sort of discussion presentation which includes Nadia Furek, Joanne Sadler, and myself. Um, Nadia and Joanne are both representing Vancouver Coastal Health, and it was that health authority that was able to offer a similar program in previous years. And so there's a tremendous amount of experience um, coming from Nadia and Joanne in this regard, and uh, they'll be able to provide you with very detailed information on the current program, but also through example from past grants and successes. Importantly, we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes where we will invite you to um, ask questions and hopefully we have the answers. Um, but if questions arise during Neil's presentation or during the panel presentation, if I could please request that you put those questions into the chat box as they appear to you, and, uh, or as they occur to you rather. And someone is monitoring that uh, chat box. Thank you very much, Anita Yao from the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit. Anita will be monitoring the chat box and we'll bring those forward during the question and answer period. Then a very short wrap up and thank you for your time today. So um, with that, there are one or two slides that I just want to sort of run through. Neil, if you could. Some people might regard this as a little bit of a departure for health in terms of its involvement in a granting program to support road safety and road infrastructure, which has typically been dealt with uh, out of other sectors and other ministries. But um, what many of you will, of course, be aware of is that while injury is the leading cause of death for all British Columbians age 1 to 44, motor vehicle crashes represent the leading cause of death and hospitalization within that, uh, that unfortunate statistic. And so the health sector has a vital interest in, in road safety because of the death, injury and serious disability. And of course, we feel that there's just a very strong ethical imper imperative on the part of the health system and public health in a preventive sense, uh, both to act. The impact on the health system is remarkable. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars annually uh, on um, the results of death, 
hospitalization and healthcare treatments that follow road related crashes and collisions. And of course, part of our issue in this is to ensure that this granting program is made available not only to address injury as I've just described it, but also the inequities inherent within some of these injury issues, uh, where people who don't have vehicles may in fact find themselves as vulnerable road users, people who live in communities where sidewalks may be something that is not present, again, finding themselves as vulnerable road users, or that their modes of transport differ from being able to climb into a car and transporting themselves, all of which are the focus of this grant program. So within the principles of Vision Zero, which Neil is going to talk about, we hope that projects will be motivated to not only think about safety and prevention, but to focus on vulnerable road users, road users and the inequities that they experience. Um, road safety is a top priority in this province. I've just described why we believe there's an imperative for health to do this, but the injury prevention community in this province has for the last three or four years been working on its strategic priorities. And without much surprise to those who are in that sector, road safety has emerged as one of the top three priorities. And quite clearly within the road safety priority, the identification of pedestrians, cyclists, and other vulnerable road users is critical. And so the action plan that is coming forward from that community uh, being recommended to um, public health and to government uh, is only bolstered and supported by this Vision Zero Road Safety uh, Grant Program. And so for that, we're, ver we're very thankful. So the next sector, oh, sorry, slide. <laughs> so I've implied it a little bit, why focus on vulnerable road users? Well, of course, there are a significant number of deaths and injuries, as I've just described from all road related crashes, but the vulnerable road users represent a significant and very troubling proportion of that statistic. By definition, most vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups of road users are disproportionately affected. Um, and whoop, we need to go back a slide. Okay. Um, those living in so, low socioeconomic status uh, communities, those who experience um, mobility only through pedestrian activity or through cycling, if that's even afforded, uh, together with the indigenous communities represent communities that we're most concerned about. High risk um, vulnerable users, sorry, are traveling um, greater distances in a situation um, where they are vulnerable. Quite often they work at considerable or live at distances away from where they might work or where they need, may need to access services. And so all of these represent additional risk in terms of per triple kilometer travel. However, a focus on vulnerable road users, we know from previous research and evidence will um, benefit all road users. And so while one, one may question why a focus on vulnerable road users, well, because it's good for everybody. And coupled with this, we want to attend to vulnerable road users, pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists, because they, they represent a more climate friendly, if I can use it, particularly at these times, a more climate friendly approach to mobility. Um, and we're very concerned that not only do we want to improve the health, safety and well-being of road users, we want to ensure that the environment, the ecosystem is part of um, what we can address in a positive sense. And so with that, I think that I will move on to the next slide and just 
describe to you the objectives of today's web webinar, which first and foremost, of course, is to provide information on the granting program, including the overall purpose and objectives, to provide you with information on what Vision Zero is, what its key pillars are, what's proven to work best in terms of protecting vulnerable, vulnerable road users. I'm very sorry, I'm having trouble with that word today. Inform participants of the general grant criteria and what's involved in you applying for a grant and some words on how grants will be reviewed and adjudicated. And then finally, of course, to respond to questions um, from you as participants. So that's it from me for now. I would now like to ask Neil to take the slide deck and to move through his presentation um, in terms of speaking to the Vision Zero program and its principles. Okay, thank you, Ian. That's a wonderful uh, overview of our, of our uh, Vision Zero program and uh, indeed of our webinar this afternoon. That's terrific, thank you very much. Yeah, so what I'll cover, as Ian suggested, is um, just a bit of background and context about road safety real quick. Quick overview of the safe system approach because it's so important um, and it remains so fundamental. And then the five principles of safe and sustainable urban transport, transport um, sorry, road design, a bit of a focus on urban settings um, and the role of some non-infrastructure related initiatives as well. So in terms of background and content, just remember, it's important to remember that, you know, road crashes kill 1.35 million people each year and injure between 20 and 50 million. Don't even know exactly how many because records aren't that perfect, but that's 3,600 people killed per day. And we also know that there's large differences in performance between countries. And that tells us that the countries that are not performing well could be doing a lot better or the jurisdictions that are not performing well and the gaps are huge. Road safety is not given good priority and there's a lot large uh, potential for improvements simply by deploying proven solutions. In health, sometimes we talk about wicked problems. I always argue that road safety is not a wicked problem because we actually have the research, we have the solutions, uh, we have the evidence, we know what to do. The issue is making it a priority and acting. Uh, and indeed it's a worsening situation globally. When we look at um, road deaths are often measured in terms of um, how many per 100,000 people in the population. And globally it's increasing from 19 per 100,000 to 22 by 2060. So it's a problem that's actually getting bigger and not smaller. Uh, and if we just look at Canada, for example, we can take assault, death from assaults, terrorism and warring, combine those three, and that's just 15% of road crash victim fatalities. Our road crash fatality problem in BC or Canada, actually either one is about double that of the world's best performance. So if we perform just at the level of Sweden or, or, or the Netherlands, and they used to perform very poorly, by the way, we could half our fatalities and our trauma. trauma. Uh, another thing to add on much research shows that we're making the least amount of progress <clears throat> for pedestrians and cyclists. So, so to Ian's point, this is why we need to focus on the vulnerable road users um, because we've been making the least amount of progress. In some cases, some numbers have been going up. And uh, you know, there's a University of Colorado Denver study that shows that when cities make roads, uh, cities safer for vulnerable road users, they become safer for everybody. So this takes us to part two, the safe system approach. Again, really fundamental uh, to the way of modern thinking uh, around road safety. I'll start with Vision Zero, name of our program, aptly named. Uh, it started off in Sweden and the Netherlands in the 1990s. And it's the idea that we can eliminate, uh, it's not about eliminating actually accidents. It's not about eliminating injuries, it's specifically serious injuries, which are typically defined for lack of a better measure as overnight stay in hospital or longer and deaths. And I've heard people say, you know, this is a pie in the sky notion. Um, and well, uh, a group out of uh, Germany has created this DECRA interactive map and they've been chronicling 
the number of cities in the world with populations of 50,000 and over, just those, there'd be smaller ones, but these are you know, reasonably uh, mid-sized and larger cities, they have actually already achieved vision zero. And there are hundreds. So if people say it's pie in the sky, point them to the DECRA interactive map. And then in 2019, in uh, Norway, uh, two cities achieved vi vision zero that were actually really large. So this was historic as well. Oslo, 600,000 people. Helsinki, 1.1 million people. No vulnerable road user deaths and only one car driver death. So it's obviously real, but fundamentally it's based on this. In every situation, a person might fail, but the road system should not. And the reason for that is there are countless reasons why people crash. I mean, studies show more and more things. You can be dehydrated and that increases your crash risk. You can have diabetes that increases your crash risk. Obviously alcohol, um, all kinds of medical conditions increase your crash risk. You know, a time change that we might experience twice a year increases your crash risk. Um, uh, and further research from Australia uh, shows that um, uh, it's not just, you know, obviously those alcohol and drugs, you know, those are big problems. They get a lot of media attention. But what doesn't get a lot of media attention is ordinary people. <laughs> that me, I'm just hearing a little background there. It seems to be gone. Um, the Australians have uh, documented research that shows that 60% um, of road crash fatalities and 90% of serious injuries from road crashes involve just ordinary people making ordinary mistakes. So this takes us to, you know, if we look at the classic pillars, you know, of the system, which is, you know, roads, drivers, speeds, vehicles. Um, and we think of it like the Swiss cheese model. We've been talking about the Swiss cheese model in terms of, um, in terms of COVID, for example. My slides keep uh, progressing on their own. Must be a ghost in this place. Um, and these layers, you know, exist, but they're not perfect. There's holes in them. And, and then uh, low performing jurisdictions, the holes are, are, are bigger and they're, and they're large and they're more, more of them, sorry. And a serious injury crash or death, a, a death is a serious injury, happens when an event gets through all of those holes. And so safe system theory is really quite simple. It's plugging up those holes. We want to have stronger measures for drivers, roads, vehicles, and speed. So the right speed for the right kind of road. We make it impossible, almost impossible, for a serious injury event to get through the system. Um, you know, at the old school. The old view was road crashes are just unfortunate accidents that happen and that there's little we can do about. It. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily so old because a lot of people still think that's the case. Along with the fact that, you know, we just don't give road safety a lot of attention. We don't give it a lot of profile. We don't talk about it like we talk about other things that actually are much lower down in terms of the burden on injury or health. But we know today from countless studies and jurisdictions the world over, that road crashes are system failures that are, can be managed and reduced in systematic ways, that it is a science. It is not happen chance, but a science. And so we're just gonna go through five principles of urban road design that, um, that um, talk about, you know, what, what are these principles and how do, we, how do we actually do this in communities or uh, in cities? And, you know, we have to start with basic infrastructure. We'll talk about that quickly. Reduce speeds, speeds is huge how we can separate vulnerable road users through time or space, highly supported and nudged decision-making in real time, and then modal shift. So principle one is, um, principle one is just, you know, well, we gotta start with the basics. Um, you know, you have to have good access management, you have to have solid, even surfaces, good grade, good sight lines, uh, you know, all of those things, good access. So, you know, sidewalks that just end, you know, it's obviously it doesn't work. There's no place for people to go. You know, sidewalks that are closed. Construction sites without proper mitigation. We have research, Canadian research on that. Uh, Kay Teske et al. that shows that you know, injuries actually go up when we fail to provide proper mitigation. You know, uh, inadequate maintenance 
or drainage systems, um, not just in historic floods, but even in sort of ordinary times that lead to um, you know, making it difficult for vulnerable road users to pass, but also for that uh, restrict um, or uh, impede stopping distances of vehicles. No sidewalks that aren't even, that can lead to injury or, or people avoiding using them. Uh, bicycle wheel hazards, you know, when gaps are too large in a gate, for example, it could trip up a bicycle. Maintenance issues, you know, where people can't walk on, these are real photos. Um, people can't walk on a sidewalk uh, or they have to, they're forced off the edge because we have, we don't maintain vehicles um, or, or um, the sides of roads <clears throat> rather. Uh, indeed, even where we have actual crosswalks, you know, where we might not be thinking about sight lines, or maybe we thought of them, and then, you know, uh, greenery grows at meters per, per week or per month, and, but if we're not maintaining that, we're obstructing the sight lines that would have been originally anticipated by engineers. And, you know, obviously access, we have to have, have people have to get through areas. People, we have to envision people in wheelchairs, people who use wheelchairs, mobility devices, people with scooters and young children. Um, but more we can turn to, you know, this is sort of basic. This isn't that forward, but here we have a crosswalk. We have a curb cut. So a person with a wheelchair or wheel device can get down. We have tactile markings for visually impaired. We're starting to get closer. A new crosswalk here at the University of Victoria. Um, again, we have the curb cuts, we have the tactile markings for the visually impaired, we have separate dedicated um, uh, road space for pedestrians and cyclists with the elephant's feet or on the cyclist path, letting cyclists know that they actually don't have to dismount that they can ride across. So we can't forget about, you know, the basic stuff, even before we get on to the more elaborate stuff. Although, Principle two, reduce speeds is kind of basic too. We know that um, shorter stopping distances uh, that basically reduce speeds have two marvelous qualities. They exponentially reduce the odds of an accident happening in the first place. And then secondly, even if a crash occurs, the amount of kinetic energy released in that crash will be exponentially reduced. Um, and then there are other things, you know, when you're going slower, not your field of vision, but your effective field of vision gets wider. You can see more. And obviously you have more time to take, take things in. Research shows too at crosswalks, et cetera, that when their drivers are going slowly, more slowly, they're actually more likely to stop for pedestrians. Um, but the research the world over, Rune Elvik uh, out of Norway, et cetera, one of the most esteemed thinkers in road safety, when he looked at study after study, hundreds of studies, he concluded simply, when speeds go up, deaths and injuries go up. And when speeds go down, deaths and injuries go down. This poster in Lancashire in the UK uh, shows it well. If this girl is hit at um, 20 miles per hour, um, or rather if she's hurt at, hit at uh, 30 miles an hour, she's seven times more likely to die than at 20. And lots of research in the world bears that out too. Uh, crash risk increasing. That's about, you know, the difference between 30 um, and 50 kilometers an hour. Um, and much research shows that the, uh, you know, five to eight times uh, risk of death between that, those two different speeds. And there's lots of ways to reduce speeds. You know, we can change the speed limit. We can reduce, communi have community uh, safety zones. Obviously, uh, traffic calming measures or what engineers called horizontal or vertical deflection. We can narrow a road or we can, we can create speed humps. Either way, we can shorten, um, uh, reduce speeds. Shorter uh, curb radii. So when drivers are turning, they're forced to slow down. We'll talk about that. And other measures just to get people to stop more often. Um, and speaking of speeds, um, in 2017, 2016, uh, the provincial health officer and the deputy at the time, the pr provincial health officer was Dr. Perry Kendall and the deputy was Dr. Bonnie Henry, you probably heard of, released when the rubber meets the road. It was the first ever um, provincial health officer report dedicated to road safety. So they do one every year pretty much on various topics, but this was the first ever uh, dedicated to road safety. And um, 
there's 28 recommendations in it, recommendation 12, and I've actually listened to Bonnie, Dr. Bonnie Henry speak to this report numerous times, and the recommendation she focuses on the most, without exception, is number 12. Amend the Motor Vehicle Act to reduce the default speed limit to 30K. Again, because the research shows so much so clearly the, the huge um, and everlasting benefits of reduced speeds. And we can start by reducing speeds. You, Victoria did this where I live in 2014 in the downtown core, but many other cities have, uh, even in BC. This is growing um, across the province. We're seeing more motions and more, uh, uh, more changes across BC to reduce speeds in urban and near urban places. Or, you know, measures like a chicane, which is basically um, that horizontal deflection when a curb cut comes out on one side and then the other, and basically you make it very difficult uh, for drivers to go fast. And, you know, do these kinds of measures work? Well, a 20 year longitudinal study, 20 years of data over time, published in the Medi British Medical Journal, uh, looked at 32 kilometer an hour zones where traffic calming measures were utilized. And they found a 42% reduction in road casualties with the biggest impact on children. And a researcher I talked to in University of Sheffield said, now if you had a drug that could produce a 42% reduction in people suffering from an illness, you would make a fortune. And this does the same thing, you know, a raised crosswalk, kind of great and simple because it reduces speeds, you know, right where people need to cross the street. Um, and narrower lanes and narrower roads. On provincial highways, the research is a bit more complicated, um, but in urban places, it's pretty consistent. When we narrow roads or lanes, people are forced to slow down and pay more attention. They think it's harder and that's good because they slow down and they pay attention. It's like a roundabout. People don't like them because they're forced to slow down and they're forced to think. But in the road safety, that's exactly the outcome we want. Um, but in the 1950s, you know, when a lot of our infrastructure was built and that we've inherited and we're locked into a lot of it, it's gonna take a while to untie it. The thinking was very different. Take these um, two corners, uh, uh, these, these, two, uh, these two photos where you can see a really long, turning radii. So the whole focus back then wasn't on vulnerable road users. It was on vehicle speeds and throughputs. How many vehicles could we get through and how fast could we get them through? So that long um, turning radius would equate to and lend themselves to higher vehicle speeds. And then if that wasn't bad enough, we could just do the next thing that would make things even worse. And we would create long crossing distances for pedestrians. And therefore we would increase their exposure, we increase the conflict zone, the amount of time that they would be exposed to traffic. And unfortunately, these are some of the things that we've inherited. Uh, in Manila, the Philippines, they recognize these high speed curves and they've filled them in um, and to reduce vehicle speeds, but also to reduce the, again, the amount of time that vulnerable road users spend in the conflict zone. That's just an example. There's lots of measures we could talk on and on about a lot of these things, but we're just kind of going through them, you know, kind of quickly and giving some high level examples, um, you know, uh, given the sort of the amount of time that we have today. So we'll just move to principle three, which is greater separation of different types of road users, particularly vulnerable road users from motor vehicle traffic. So we can avoid or prevent crashes by separating vulnerable road users through space or time. And there's lots of examples and we'll just walk through some of them. Um, this isn't one of them. This is just a typical kind of um, concurrent movement where the driver has a green light and the pedestrians have a walk signal. I mean, if I was an alien and I had landed on earth, I, you people have done this. I mean, I'd, I'd be kind of wondering what's going on. Why, why, why on earth do we actually allow 3,000 pound vehicles to turn at the same time as pedestrians have a walk signal? But we do. It's called a permissive uh, signal turn as opposed to a protected one where only one thing is allowed to happen at a time. I actually led a research study with UBC in 2019. And uh, interesting, we um, looked at 12 years of BC data we actually had 21,777 motor vehicle and pedestrian crashes. 
which is just kind of depressing alone in a 12 year period, we had 21,000 pedestrian vehicle crashes. And that's based on police data, which is underreported. Anyway, we found that um, serious trauma is four times more likely to happen at a left turn than a right turn. Again, what does it come down to? The thing that we talk about most, speed. Left turns have higher speeds than right turns. But even at right turns, they're dangerous. You know, we allow a right turn on red, for example, and just mounds of research and simulators, University of Toronto, Oregon State University, show the same thing when they even, you know, use cameras or simulators. A whole bunch of drivers um, aren't paying attention. They aren't even looking for pedestrians. Uh, in the, uh, in uh, Montreal, you know, 58% of uh, turning drivers made some kind of error in detecting uh, a pedestrian. You know, so instead, we can do things like have dedicated uh, signal heads. We can have cyclists go and no one else goes. We can ban the right turn on red. That can actually be a sign. It's fairly cheap. We can have um, channelized or dedicated left turns. Uh, all of these things are very possible to do. And just kind of related to that is the uh, something that's been hugely taken off all over the world, uh, being implemented in BC far and wide. Uh, New York City has hundreds of these. It's called a leading pedestrian interval. It's totally low cost. Anybody wants to know about what's a low cost road safety measure? It's basically two hours of a technician's time to adjust the signal timing so that after the red light for cars, the pedestrian sign comes on alone and gives the pedestrians an advance. Could be three, four, any, any 12 seconds. So while it, that pedestrian walk sign is on, it's still red for all motor vehicles. It just gives them a head start. And some people might think, well, you're putting them out in traffic sooner. Well, you'd be putting them out in traffic anyway, but by putting them out in traffic sooner, it's still red for cars. They have to stop um, and you become more visible. Uh, and regardless, the research shows again clearly that these are working and that's why they become so popular. They're actually, you know, many people I've heard why every intersection should be a leading pedestrian interval. But boldness, boldness, maybe it was more pre predominant in the past than it is in the present. This is Vancouver and Hastings. People were crossing the street in all directions. Um, we used to have something called pedestrian scrambles. And now we're bringing them back. This is Victoria's first one implemented two years ago. Um, like you can see, you know, the kind of celebration of life and people and movement, but more importantly, it's all red in all directions. We don't have concurrent movements. And um, regardless of what anyone says, the US Department of Transportation concluded that, re that pedestrian scrambles reduce pedestrian vehicle crashes, crashes by one third. Uh, we can make it even better when we have dedicated uh, movements. We can, for example, automate um, uh, the detection of cyclists like this one in Saanich, automatically uses uh, uh, radar pucks. This intersection was redone for a cost of about 25,000 in terms of the radar pucks, in terms of detecting uh, pedestrians before they cross. And then just moving over to, um, so that was, we just gone through separation of vulnerable road users through time. Right? We can improve safety by separating people from traffic through time, allowing different things to happen at a different time. The other thing is obviously through space. Um, like in this photo, for example, you know, we can have better sidewalks. They can be standard on all streets. They can be wider. They can go where they haven't gone before. Um, and they can be set back from the road. Obviously, the more they're set back from the road, um, the better. And sorry, this is a bit like the similar slide I realized, but. Um, this is just another example of there's not much separation here, but again, this is very similar to the previous slide. We've got a hugely long crossing distance. I mean, there's a curb cut and there's actually an in concrete um, tactile markings, so a couple of points there. But after that, it's, it's pretty much failure. We've got a hugely long um, exposure to traffic and we've got pretty long turning radii at the same time but no separation through space. But this new sidewalk in the Nanaimo uh, is actually level. So it does not go down, it's a continuous sidewalk. And in fact, the vehicles have to go up or down. You can see it's, it's wider, uh, it's continuous, um, uh, and it you know, simply gives priority to pedestrians. And then this measure um, is one 
uh, not too far from where I live. And you can see this is the, you know, an existing crosswalk and you've got some plastic bollards, bollards. And again, this is pretty low cost, but when you think about what those bollards are actually doing, they're shortening the crossing distance. So they're reducing the conflict zone. So they get a point there. They're removing parking near that crosswalk and therefore removing potential site line uh, obstructions. Another point there. And then they nudge drivers to reduce their speeds because they just make the crosswalk so much more visible. So another point there. So three things going on at least at an extremely low cost. Uh, Tony Churchill, uh, city of Calgary, uh, engineer there came up with this, the, it's now called the Churchill curve. Uh, it's a bit more permanent, but it's actually still pretty low cost. And you're accomplishing many of the same things that we did in the previous photo, just a bit more permanent, right? We're um, uh, bringing more attention to that crosswalk. We're eliminating parking, we're reducing the uh, length of the crossing uh, as well. Or more traditional ones like this, you know, where the curb extensions or mid islands, you know, islands are uh, been around since 1921. Charles Price in the US began documenting these way back um, almost 100 years ago. Nothing new. Um, separation through space, just carrying on the same theme. You can see, you know, we can where this was once a road similar to the Manila photo, we can fill that in and have more separation through space. Or this is just near, not too far from where I live. This was a corner, you know, again, lots of exposure, not clear where people would cross. This, um, it's a three-way corner actually. Um, so it's a new traffic circle. And again, it um, creates more separation through space, reduces the conflict zones, et cetera. It's also was augmented by an actual pedestrian crossing. So it's clear where people cross. Sorry if I was, had the wrong uh, image up there. I meant to be showing this one. You know, bicycle lanes, um, um, you know, a study by Kay Teske, you know, looked at Toronto, led by Kay Teske, looked at Toronto and Vancouver and, you know, um, cycle tracks or proper bike lanes, you know, have one ninth the risk of major streets with uh, then compared to major streets with parked cars. So we know bike lanes work, especially when they're well designed. And just one photo, kind of a, not an urban setting, but you know they're building a fantastic connector between Tofino and Uculet, um, slated for completion in 2022. This will be 40 kilometers long. So we can do this, you know, in in uh, non-urban settings as well, which is really exciting. And when and the planners noted that you know this is obviously promoting low carbon transport, but it's also good for tourism and the economy as well. So there's just a multitude of benefits. So again, some examples. <clears throat> we'll just go to principle four, which is highly supported and nudge decision making. So this is actually nudging people to do what's safer in real time and in real place. And there's lots of ways that we could do this. We kind of talked about some of them already. But paint, you know, making something a crossing more visual, you know, that's nudging. This is, uh, you know, a wave crosswalk and of all places to Fino, BC. This is the rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So it's a crosswalk, but the, the, the beacon is high intensity, almost as bright and as intense as, a, as, a, as the flashing lights of a police car um, and huge uh, reductions to uh, injury. Something that's from Europe, but they've actually been trialing um, in Virginia is zigzag lane marking. So again, you know, when we talk low cost, we've <laughs> we've we've changed the pattern of the lane marking. Um, yet, just by doing that, you can achieve uh, really good benefits. And their studies show that it increases motorists' awareness of pedestrians and their likelihood that they'll yield, and uh, very favorable results from again, a very simple measure or, or a simple measure like this, which is an on roadway sign, 500 bucks. It reduced the rate at which drivers fail to stop from 17% to just 2.5%, 500 bucks. Or, you know, maybe there's no cost to this at all. It's just when we have a crosswalk or an intersection, we, we put the stop line back further away, increases the visibility of pedestrians, increases the amount of visual scanning the drivers do because researchers have observed this and that actually happens and it up, up to the likelihood of drivers coming to a stop. Again, you know, paint. 
Um, we're nudging people to do the right things in the right place, just bringing more awareness to the fact that there are uh, cyclists, e-scooters, et cetera, at the intersection crossing here. Or the Danish crosswalk, you know, makes a, it's a mid island with a fence, but it forces people to walk uh, in the direction of oncoming traffic. So when you cross, you have to turn right and you're actually facing the traffic that you're gonna cross next. Uh, simple measure just builds on a really good thing anyway, which is a mid crossing island. And then principle five um, is modal shift. So the kinds of things we can actually do to move, and again, to Ian's comment about climate change, um, uh, you know, we can improve safety when we make it better for vulnerable road users, but also when we shift more people from private cars to walking, cycling, and public transit, we, do, we, we achieve a lot of benefits to the environment for climate change, and also other things not related to climate change, just environmental contaminants and pollution and things that destroy our ecosystems uh, whenever we, drive less no matter what that's powered by. So public transport, it's a good thing. Even if it's not electric, it's still better. Um, uh, you know, and uh, good facilities in Squamish and for in, uh, when weather is inclement, inclement um, so that we continue to encourage and support people to use these active modes. Uh, in the Netherlands, they don't even build cars, uh, roads for cars in some situations. It's public transit, scooters and people walking. Um, and then facilities, you know, we need to we need bicycle parking, for example, we need to think through the whole sort of cycle of trips. Um, there's this notion of filtering as well, in terms of, you know, again, we're on the theme of modal shift. Um, we can create uh, filtering so that it's so cars don't get on certain roads, but cyclists and pedestrians do, you know, just another example of filtering uh, in this situation here. We're making it more attractive. You know, this is a new bike route, bike lane in Victoria. I apologize, I have a few too many bike, uh, photos in Victoria. It's just because where I live, it's where I live and it's easy for me to get these photos. But a lot of these things could be um, implemented anywhere. You know, that's clear. They're, they're, they're sound, uh, they're sound uh, concepts, sound designs. So, you know, the whole shift around placemaking, et cetera. It encourages more people to be out of their cars and, and uh, um, engage in active transport. You know, another movement is closed roads, especially, you know, with schools, uh, school days, closing roads altogether. Or as we saw in the pandemic, you know, closing um, streets uh, in the downtown core or in mall areas where there was once parking. Um, so those are the five kind of principles. And, um, and I just wanna kind of couple more um, slides I just want to show you on some noteworthy designs that incorporate multiple principles, which are kind of interesting, well, which are very interesting. Um, this is North America's first fully protected intersection at Bernard and Cornwall Avenue in Vancouver. Um, sorry, the first one was there. This one is actually the second one at Quebec Street and First Avenue. And it does all kinds of things. We have basic infrastructure, right? Obviously you can see everything is in good shape, the grade, uh, the conditions are flat, you have the tactile markings, the curb cuts, you have all of that stuff. But then you've got reduced speeds because of the turning radius on that curb, it's tight. So you have to really slow down to turn. And in fact, you'll note the, um, the curb island here, there's four of these, and that, um, that actually forces the tighter turning radius. So we have reduced speeds, principle two. Do we have separation in space and time? Yeah, we do. We have protected signal heads or protected signal phases. So when pedestrians and cyclists cross, motor vehicles do not. We also have separation in space because you can see that there's clearly demarcated space for cars, separate space for cyclists and separate space for pedestrians. Do we have highly supported and nudged decision-making? Um, yeah, we do. We've got paint. We've got all kinds of visuals, right, to tell people or remind people that there are pedestrians and cyclists in this area. Uh, and I suppose you could argue we have modal shift because if we had all intersections that were looking like this, it'd be pretty attractive to be an active transport user. Um, so this is just the same um, intersection, just at a different angle. Uh, photo courtesy of Roy Simons. Something else um, 
similar is when you look at a traditional intersection design, it's something we talked about earlier. You have the purple area is kind of the exposure or the conflict zone. So you could have cars turning tight or wide, but you could get hit as a pedestrian almost in any area crossing the street. And I've seen this happen. Um, you also, because there, you can, it can accommodate the type of turning radius, you can have higher speeds. So something that's been done <clears throat> um, in cities like Washington, New York is just plastic bollards and rubber bumpers. Um, that essentially uh, create that tighter turning radius and reduce speeds and reduce the size of the conflict zone. So again, this is Washington DC, um, super cheap overall compared to many of the road investments that are required to make today, um, but effective. And then this slide just depicts, you know, um, because we have this grant program and this is a, not, not it's a modest grant program for sure, absolutely. And one of the things we're gonna talk about, Nadia and Joanne and Ian, you know, is the partnership approach to um, in terms of uh, building even more funding beyond our program. But these are just some things that, you know, what can be done at low cost, you know? Um, so this slide was uh, validated by two engineers, one in Vancouver, and one in uh, Liliana Quintero in Vancouver and Tony Churchill in Calgary, actually, in terms of the costs. So it gives you an idea of for a few thousand dollars um, or as little as 500, right? Um, some of the measures that can be, that can be uh, implemented just in terms of scale. And then I just wanted to speak to our, well, our, our, our program focuses on infrastructure. Um, you know, there is room for non-infrastructure uh, initiatives as well, particularly for indigenous groups who are able to identify their own road safety uh, priorities, but for others as well, um, uh, we'll be looking at some non-infrastructure as well. Um, and uh, in the past, Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser, which you'll hear more about, imp did implement Vision Zero. So a couple of project that, projects that uh, were implemented, I think are really great examples, like, uh, Owekano First Nation um, identified some of the priorities that they had for road safety, which included uh, the need for speed limits and stop signs to be augmented, uh, a community awareness campaign, uh, a First Nations MAD program, and a community taxi on Friday nights, obviously to help address the problem of uh, drinking and driving, which is so rampant in so many communities. So that was an, just an example of another project or one in um, Fraser Health was the uh, Surrey's Restorative Justice Program, which was rather interesting because it just uh, allows um, instead of a when a young a targeted young driver, 16 to 25, instead of a violation ticket, they would actually get um, do a couple hours of community service and participate in a safe driver dialogue circle where they could talk about and actually learn about some of their actions as drivers. And, um, and road safety. And just a couple of quotes, you know, this program is a great way to understand our mistakes and fix them instead of, instead of having to pay a ticket and not learn anything, a male 19 years old. The circle allowed me to realize my mistakes and the harm I could have caused by not following the speed limit, a female 16 years. And that actually concludes my part in this. And um, again, we'll uh, leave the, we're gonna kind of do the questions at the end. Um, We've uh, motored through to a hopefully loud time uh, for that. So I'll just turn it over. Thanks a lot. Um, and I'll just turn it over to uh, Nadia and Joanne and Ian. Thanks very much, Neil, for your excellent and very thorough presentation. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining this webinar today. My name is Nadia Furek, and I'm the Health Promotion and Prevention Lead at Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, and Alongside with some of my colleagues here on the call today, um, I we have led the uh, the VCH Vision Zero grant program in, in previous years. So, um, before passing it over to Joanne and Ian to speak a little bit more about the current provincial grant program, uh, we thought we'd kick the section off with a few examples of, of projects that VCH has funded in the past through our through our uh, Vision Zero C grant program to give you uh, a bit of a flavor for the types of projects that, that could potentially be eligible for funding in this current call out. Um, I will note, and just to reiterate Neil's point, and Joanne will speak a little bit more about this as well, that the current call out um, 
we will be prioritizing infrastructure related projects, um, but you'll see some of the in the VCH program, um, our grants were, were slightly a smaller scale and so therefore we, we invited non infrastructure projects as well. Um, and as Neil said, we'll still invite these into the provincial program, but just to note that we will prioritize infrastructure um, initiatives. Uh, next slide please Neil. So, uh, and next slide again. Thank you. Um, so Vancouver Coastal Health uh, initiated a Vision Zero Seed Grant Program in 2019 and subsequently in 2020 as well. Um, and the intention of this program is to support community-driven road safety projects uh, designed to reduce serious and fatal injuries resulting from transport-related incidents. Um, and then so, similar to the current grant program, our, our program prioritized applications for projects that focused on vulnerable road users uh, for the reasons that Ian and Neil have, have already spoken to. Um, our program was open to First Nations, local governments, regional districts, school districts, and other community organizations within the VCH region, um, some of which I think are on the call today. It's nice to see some familiar names in the, in the participant list, so great to have you. Um, in 2019, we funded four projects ranging from five to $15,000. Um, and I should note that this was, this was the amount that BCH contributed through our grant program, but uh, oftentimes recipients leveraged this funding to obtain dollars from, from other sources, which we highly encouraged you. Um, so in 2019, the recipients were the Squamish Nation, Village of Pemberton, Bowen Island, and the Owekinook Nation, which Neil spoke about, and thank you for that. Um, in 2020, we funded six projects, but the range was slightly smaller. So project range from $800 to $5,000. And uh, again, that's in terms of the VCH contribution to the, to the project. Um, and the recipients were the Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Centre Society, Lund Community Society, Better Environmentally Sound Transportation, Weekend Oak Nation, and that's a, that was a follow-up to the, their project in the prior year, uh, Gibson's Elementary School Pack, and the D Douglas First Nation. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, due to the pandemic, many of these recipients had to shift gears within their organization. So a few of these projects are still ongoing um, due to needing to put some of the work on hold over the past number of months, but uh, some of them are wrapped up as well. Um, so over the next few slides, I'll just highlight a few of these projects in a bit more detail to give you a sense of, of what they involved and kind of the size of the grant they received, as well as some of the components that led us as an adjudication panel to decide to fund them, of course, within the constraints of, of a limited pod um, I'll just speak to three of them, but if anyone's interested in hearing about the other projects that, I, that were listed on the previous slide, I'm happy to chat about those offline if, if you're interested. Uh, so the first project here uh, was submitted by uh, the Village of Pemberton, and this project received $9,500 via the BCH grant program. Um, and so just for a bit of context, the problem identified here is that there is a main road that runs through the Village of Pemberton, which is owned and, and operated by Moti. Um, and this stretch sees thousands of cars each day. Um, and despite the road having a speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour, and intersecting a school zone, um, the RCMP noted multiple, numerous, uh, uh, numerous instances of speeding, thus creating quite an unsafe and uncomfortable environment for, for children who need to use this road to cross and, and get to school. Uh, so this project involved the, uh, the village of Pemberton and the RCMP approaching Moti to install a process crossing signal at this particular location, which you can kind of see there, it's a bit far away. Um, and uh, Moti was, was supportive and ultimately provided the permits necessary to, to complete this work. So post installation, the results have been great so far. The community has reported decreases in near misses, lower speeding, or sorry, less speeding, um, and other violations in the area as well. Um, and overall, there's been reports of just kind of an overall better sense of safety and comfort in the area, which allows more children and, and families to use this, this crossing as part of their regular route to school. Um, so we saw this project as a, as a really great opportunity to implement an evidence-based uh, intervention to increase safety in a small community, um, which contributes to, to more active transportation as well. And we also liked the fact that this uh, project involved quite a bit of partnership and co-funding involved in the initiative um, as it allowed Pemberton to leverage the BCH grant funding to obtain funding from, from other sources to really amplify and, and increase the scale of the project. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the second project that I'll highlight here was led by the 
Gibson's Elementary School of Park on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and it involved engagement with their school and community regarding the implementation of a safe and best routes to school map, which you can see a screenshot of there, um, that had been developed by the Sunshine Coast School District. So only a small, as you can see, only a small amount of funding was requested for this project. Um, and it was really used to fund initiatives to engage with parents and students to gather input on this map and generate feedback, which could then be used to justify and, and really advocate for, for better infrastructure in, in um, the surrounding communities. So this project piqued our interest for, for a few reasons. Um, first, a lot of a lot of work was already underway and, and ongoing, and, and this grant really just provided that tad bit of extra funding that was needed to move it to the next step. So we really like to see projects that are already well thought out and have already gone through some of that initial planning and thinking work and are ready to hit the ground running. Um, second, there is population level data indi indicating low levels of active travel on the coast. Uh, part of which is due to actual and, and perceived safety. Um, so there's much, much, uh, so, so there's a lot of need uh, to provide better and, and safer infrastructure. Um, and this project generated some of the tools that could be used to, to advocate for some of these much, much needed changes. Um, and then lastly, similar to the, the Pemberton project, actually, this project demonstrated a lot of uh, partnership uh, and connections as part of their project uh, to really amplify the, the impact and exposure of this work. And then next slide, please. Sorry, it's not cooperating. That's okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, so the last project I'll highlight before passing it over to Joanne um, is one in our current round uh, submitted by the uh, Lund Community Society. So Lund is a small community located north of, of Powell River on the coast. Um, and Bike Lund is a recently established bike advocacy committee for the Lund Community Society. Um, and the funding for this project went towards a number of Bike Lund's initiatives. So first one being the development of a community bike fleet, which, which commun community, community members can, can tap into. Um, a, a program called Spokes for Cadet Folks. I hope I'm saying that right. It's the regional district in that area. Um, and is a program that provides bikes for, for low income folks who, who, who would like the opportunity to, to, to use cycling as a mode of transport. Um, and lastly, a program called Puddle Jumpers, which uh, provides education and training uh, to children and their parents about safe cycling behaviors. So while this project overall wasn't strictly injury prevention per se, we, we, we did see the potential for Bike Lund, um, which was a relatively new advocacy organization in the area to use this funding. Uh, to develop some of these programs and, and start to build their credibility to, to strengthen their advocacy efforts with MOTI, who, who operates and owns and operates many of the main roads in, in this area um, about much needed infrastructure in London and, and surrounding coastal communities, where sometimes the, the, um, the only way to get around on a bike is on a very tight, narrow shoulder of a, of a winding road on the highway. Um, so overall, uh, the adjudication panel felt that this was a very worthwhile project to, to fund. Um, and next slide, please. So, so hopefully these, these projects give you a, better, a bit of a better sense of the types of Vision Zero projects that we've funded in the past uh, through our BCH program. Um, and, and just kind of based on our two years of experience of, of providing the, this type of funding and, and seeing which projects have had the most success and, and impact, um, sorry, success and impact. Um, here, here are just a few tips that Joanne and I have put together that may help you as you start to think about your potential projects and, and help you prepare your applications. So first of all, we think it's, it's, it's very important to um, identify a project lead in your organization who will have the capacity and, and skill set to carry out the project from, from start to finish. Um, secondly, and I know Ian will speak a little bit more about evaluation later on, but, but start to identify what you hope to get out of your project and, and more importantly, ways that you can track progress and success. Um, if you're unsure about a project, you're thinking about something, but not sure if it would be eligible for funding, feel free to reach out to us um, for, for the BCI for you or, and or your, your local health authority, uh, and we can provide some input and feedback um, based on what you're thinking so far. And then lastly, and 
talked a little bit about this and you saw that in some of the examples is that we would strongly encourage you to consider co-funding opportunities to really amplify the, the impact of, of your project. So with that, um, I'll pass it over to you, Joanne, uh, to speak a bit more about the Provincial Vision Zero Grant Program, which is similar to, to BCHs in, in many ways, but uh, a few differences that, that Joanne will speak about now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, hi, everyone. So as uh, Nadia mentioned, I'm, I'm Joanne Sadler. I'm the Injury Prevention Lead for Vancouver General Hospital Trauma Services. So I also work in injury prevention uh, within BCH. And uh, I'll move on now to discuss the Provincial Vision Zero and Road Safety Grant Program, uh, which is in its first year. It was very similar to the program that uh, Nadia just spoke to, but with some key differences in terms of grant size and eligible projects. Uh, and it's also a provincial program, meaning that anyone can apply across BC and each health authority has the same amount of grant funding to allocate to local projects. Uh, next slide, please, Neil. So the main objective of the Vision Zero and Road Safety Grant Program is to improve the outcomes of vulnerable road users in BC over the immediate and long term using evidence informed road, road design change measures. And so we want to reduce the occurrence of road crashes involving vulnerable road users, reduce the injuries and the severity of the injuries, and in turn, decrease the number of vulnerable road users accessing our healthcare system. And we also hope that this program builds capacity in road safety in the health sector uh, and among local and Indigenous community governments. Uh, by doing this, we want to advance the implementation of road safety measures in BC that are innovative, technology-driven, evidence-based, and low cost. And uh, thank you, Neil, for going through many of those options earlier on in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the program is open to local governments, Indigenous governments, and non-governmental organizations. And so for example, that includes school districts, parent advisory councils, and road safety advocacy groups. Uh, so where NGOs apply, preference will be given to those who have a partnership with a local or Indigenous government and a focus on road infrastructure improvements. Uh, next slide, please. So each health authority will have two streams of funding. Uh, funding stream one is intended for the design and installation of infrastructure improvements to increase the safety of vulnerable road users. And these projects can be temporary, uh, otherwise known as pilot projects, or permanent. And uh, this grant stream is intended for infrastructure projects, so they will likely incur, uh, they will likely require engineering or local government administrator approval to proceed with construction and installation. And Neil mentioned many examples of stream one eligible projects earlier on, so traffic signal timing changes, raised crosswalks, solar powered feedback signs are just a few examples. Uh, stream two funding is for road safety improvements directed by Indigenous communities. Uh, also with a focus on vulnerable road users. And this stream includes road infrastructure changes as mentioned for stream one, but also can include projects such as road safety planning, community consultations, and public awareness campaigns. So projects that are similar to, uh, for example, the ones discussed by Nadia from Gibsons and Lund. And uh, we do want to note that for stream one, while we will, will prefer and prioritize infrastructure projects, we will also consider some non-infrastructure projects and it will depend on the impact of your project and the strength of your application. Uh, so if you're unsure if your project qualifies for a certain stream, uh, please reach out to the BCIRPU for uh, advice. Next slide, please. Uh, so the funding amount uh, this year can range from $5,000 to $20,000 and grants may be awarded up to $20,000 if the initiative delivers safety benefits to a large number of people. There's a partnership model in place that involves additional financial contributions from at least one other partner organization. And there's a sound evaluation plan in place and sufficient expertise to execute the project. And just a note, funding uh, will not be provided for profit-making activities, cash prizes, purchases of alcohol and other drugs, and ongoing operating expenses for established programs or projects. Uh, next slide, please. So applications will be assessed in the following areas. So we'll take a look at project need. So how have you identified that this is a relevant road safety issue in your community? Uh, so we're looking for detail and evidence and local data is preferred. Uh, we will look at your project's alignment with Vision Zero and the safe systems approach. 
we will consider feasibility. So how possible is it that activities listed can be accomplished in the time frame presented and with the funding that you have requested? Uh, we'll look at partnerships and collaborations. So will the project build connections in your community? Does it foster collaboration? And uh, make sure you identify how the partnerships will support or benefit the project. Uh, we'll look at strength of impact. So how will your project activity reduce injuries in your community? Um, essentially, what is the anticipated impact of your initiatives? And also, will it further discussions around road safety in your community? Uh, evaluation. So we're looking for applications that have a plan in place to show that your project has made an impact. And Ian will discuss what that looks like uh, shortly. And uh, sustainability. We're looking to see if your application includes options to maintain the impact of your project beyond this grant. Uh, if it requires ongoing resources, uh, do you have an option for funding in the future? And then uh, finally, budget uh, is a clear, detailed, and based on realistic estimates. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, at, at risk of, of repeating maybe something that Nadia has said, uh, generally, we, we look forward to hearing your story. Uh, we're looking for clear and concise applications that detail how you will reduce traffic-related injuries in your community. Um, we recommend you use local data to show that there's a need. Uh, the application package on the BCIRP, BCIRPU website highlights some resources that, that could be useful in, in developing your application. So ICBC provides maps of local crash data, and the BCIRPU IDOT tool has data on injury-related injury deaths, hospitalizations, and uh, emergency department visits across BC. Um, and then again, indicating how your project will continue on after funding is important and your plan for evaluation. And as mentioned earlier, we'll be looking for uh, projects that have meaningful partnerships with other organizations in your community. Uh, when it comes to budget, uh, please mention other funding sources if you have them and uh, do not shy away from using the notes section. Uh, explaining every cost that will be involved will help the adjudication panel understand what the grant funds will be used for. And then last but not least, we encourage you to review uh, the additional suggested resources in the grant program package. Uh, and again, if you have any questions to reach out to the BCIRPU. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I've, I've addressed FAQ number one. Um, you know who to go to for, for questions. Uh, can one organization apply for multiple projects? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, you can submit more than one application, but the project has to be different. Um, can we apply for more than $20,000? Uh, 20,000 is our maximum for this year, um, but for all projects, we encourage you to consider partnership models with other grant funders. And the award term runs from April 1st, 2022 to March 31st, 2023. So it's 12 months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and on that note, I'll just uh, provide a reminder of the application timeline. So the applications are currently open and they close at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time on December 10th. So you have about three more weeks to complete your applications. Uh, we plan to adjudicate in January, so successful applicants will be notified in, in early 2022. And if you are a successful applicant, there are a few dates you need to be aware of. Uh, there's a midpoint evaluation uh, that will be due in September 2022, and the final evaluation will be due one month after the funding term ends, which is April 2023. Um, and on that note, I will pass it over to Ian to discuss uh, evaluation and what that would look like for your project. Thank you, Joanne. So um, the grant program will involve, um, your proposals must include an evaluation plan. So just very quickly, evaluation in, in how we mean it here is the systematic assessment of your project, its implementation and its results um, in terms of how you will determine the success of the project that you've proposed. Um, we're doing this because we think it gives your plan much more structure. It provides evidence of your results to you and to others. And in the, lo in the longer run, it provides us with um, a contribution to the knowledge base about how to improve road safety generally in our province. 
it really comes down to two key questions. What is the desired outcome for your Vision Zero project? And how will you measure that you've achieved that outcome? It's about building benchmarks along the way and some accountability into your plan, whether that's you or funding partners or people that you will engage with to do the work. Um, if there are, you know, what you can measure you can uh, report on. Um, and finally, it's to sort of measure and evaluate the project plan as you go along and not waiting until the plan is completed and then trying to determine, well, did we, were we successful? So the next slide. Next slide, please, Neil. Okay. Yeah, it's just in that thing again. Oh, there we go, all right. Okay. So um, Joanne has mentioned, um, we do expect that a, a good evaluation plan is included as part of the proposal. Um, we will ask that an interim evaluation report be submitted by September the 30th, 2022. So that's six months into your project. And then a final valuation by at the end of April, one month following the termination of the project period. Um, we're looking, I think, within an evaluation plan to look for things like process measures. So these are metrics that you can use to understand how your project is progressing day to day or period to period. And usually these kinds of questions are, am I on time? Am I on budget? Am I doing what I said I would do by now? Uh, and these are typically sort of re result uh, result in the use of activity logs and ongoing monitoring recording efforts. Impact measures um, are those that are, seek to understand how your project affects the tar target audience in the shorter term. So are you affecting their attitudes, knowledge, beliefs, and short-term behaviors because of the intervention that you've put in place? Are people now sort of crossing to a mid-island and facing oncoming traffic, as, as Neil sort of indicated in the, the um, presentation that he gave. Outcome measures are those that are, did your project protect and uh, vulnerable road users and improve road safety in the long run? Uh, things like, did you change the number of near misses, crashes, injuries, disabilities? And we acknowledge that some of these outcome measures may not in fact reveal themselves during the period of your project. They may be longer term. And it might be necessary for you then to focus on more proximal measures like impact in terms of knowledge, attitudes, and short-term behaviors of those that you're trying to affect with some kind of logic model that leads us to understand how those measures are connected to the outcome measures. Because it might, you may not have the data at 13 months to show that the implementation of a roundabout has resulted in fewer crashes and fewer crash-related injuries. That data may just not be there um, until that time, unless you are able to be on site and have local recording systems, which of course, would be something for you to consider as part of your evaluation plan, but might add to the expense of the project. And, you know, there's a balance to be achieved there. So the next slide. And what I've tried to do here is just give a very simple, we don't need complexity in your plan. We need to understand how the proposed intervention is going to be measured. And this is a simple, sort of plan that I'm just a piece of which I've, I've suggested as an idea. Um, if indeed your project is something to do with school safety and you want to improve the safety within a school zone by improving adherence to 30 kilometer speed zones uh, in terms of having parents and caregivers utilizing safe pickup and drop off procedures according to how they're supposed to um, and vulnerable road users using the pedestrian crossing and the separated cycle path because it's there or you're going to create one. And then the number of crashes, collisions, or near misses. These are all 
the indicators that you may use as measures or observations within your evaluation of whether your school, school safety zone intervention worked. Um, and then how you measure, they might be through observation or they may be automated. You may have um, closed circuit cameras that can gather data for you that you analyze at some point to do the counts and, and the analysis and then frequency of collection. Um, I think in these kinds of projects, again, referring to my point about the balance in terms of how often you're able to measure things related to your project, um, but the more frequent that you can make these observations, the better. So if you can be on site to make observations, um, it's always helpful. And then gathering that information helps to tell the story of how your project unfolded and how measures that you implemented changed over time in relation to how your project was implemented. And so I will leave that there. Um, and that gives us about 15 minutes, Neil for um, questions. And I think there are um, a number of questions that have come up in the chat. If you have questions that you would like to pose uh, orally, please, what I'm gonna ask you to use is the right hand reaction button on the bottom of your screen and use the uh, raise hand feature that puts you in a position on our screen where I can see you. And I'll call on you to ask the question. And please, once you've um, had a chance to ask your question, if you could then lower your hand, because otherwise you stay in that privileged position of top left corner. <laughs> so uh, first, Adrian Lewis, thank you very much. If you could unmute and ask your question, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to express gratitude for the opportunity to be on this uh, call, but also uh, working for First Nations communities as health transformation project manager. What um, I'd like to know if there is any cross pollination, number one, with the injury prevention program that Health Canada, it's a not very many much funds, but it basically collects data on injury prevention. And part of that, a subset of that data is uh, obviously to do with, um, you know, traffic accidents, right? Because there, we have data collected. Is there any pro cross pollination with that program with yourselves and in injury prevention? Neil, I'm gonna have to throw that one in your direction if you don't mind. Okay, sure thing. Thanks Adrian for the question. Yeah, we're always looking around the country and, and all of the data including the national data. I mean, we haven't plugged into that specific project specifically, but we're always looking um, at all kinds of data and, and, and actually research reports. So yeah, if you actually are able to share that, that'd be great. I'd love to take a look at it in more, in more detail. I will, uh, and uh, not to belabor that, but I absolutely will forward that on because that data, you can drill down into that data to see which is um, you know related to traffic accidents. The other question I just have to ask is because we're working in remote communities, we actually have to partner with Ministry of Transportation, do we, do we not? I'm thinking of a community that is on both sides of a highway and there is absolutely nothing there to protect people going back and forth. So how do I do that? Because <laughs> that's not urban, right? Most of your solutions were urban. Thank you. Right. I'll, I'll okay. I can ahead, speak Kate. to that, Neil. Yeah. Um, so I'm Kate Bernias. I'm the um, project lead for climate action and active transportation at the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. And um, we're happy to connect you with your local regional rep um, from the Ministry of uh, Transportation. I was going to call it Ministry of Highways. Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure um, and, uh, through the process and, and facilitate that relationship and how um, decisions are made and permits are, are given and, and infrastructure is, is provided along our highways. Thank you so much. That would be wonderful. I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for that, Adrian. Um, we have a question from Jeffrey Keyworth. Jeff. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I, I put it in the chat, but I, I think there's some background that would be difficult to uh, to talk about by, you know, by text. So I just wanted to raise it verbally, which is, so the example I'm thinking about here for near miss monitoring. Uh, so in Port Moody, we've recently got council approval to implement uh, leading pedestrian interval and also uh, increased pedestrian crossing timings at 15 signalized intersections. Uh, the total cost to implement this project, it's fairly low cost because it's really just changing the signal timing plans on a bunch of intersections. So it's about $15,000 to implement this change. And so we think it's totally worthwhile. And we have you know, research from other jurisdictions regarding benefits of LPI. So it's pretty low hanging fruit, nothing, no problems there. But in order to really demonstrate the benefit, because we, we're fortunate, I guess, that we don't have a, a rash of pedestrian vehicle collisions. So from that perspective, we're not going to be able to demonstrate a benefit using local data easily because we already don't have an extremely large uh, uh, you know, set of collisions. And so we're, we're, and then it's going to, they're going to be very lagging indicators. And so what I'm concerned about is that it will increase some delay for vehicles. If we do get pressure, you know, to council to get rid of these things, because it's delaying my drive or something like that, like, how are we going to fight against that? So one of the thoughts that we had was to do near miss like video detection at one of the intersections. Uh, you know, we can create some really compelling indicators based on the vendors we've, appro we've uh, approached. The problem is that to do that uh, near miss analysis would cost about $10,000 for one intersection. Um, and it's, it's just like, given that, you know, my budget is 15 to implement, I can't really justify 10,000 to monitor one single intersection. Like it just doesn't make sense. So I guess I'm trying to figure out if there's some way that we might be able to like centralize a resource or something like that, where, you know, if there's like a bulk purchase or whatever, you know, maybe there's a reduced cost, um, you know, where we can, we can implement this more broadly. Uh, you know, if there, I, I suspect that there would be other projects that would be interested in doing this if, if it was more cost effective. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. I, I think that's a, a very good idea to try and sort of come together with other projects that want similar sort of monitoring. And perhaps we can, um, perhaps we, you, if there are others listening who plan proposals of a similar nature in their jurisdiction, um, perhaps they can indicate quite explicitly that, you know, Jeff's idea to for bulk buy on this monitoring, um, video monitoring, if they can make note of that, then we would know the number of proposals that then we might be able to take to the supplier, Jeff, or even, pit one supplier with another to try and get a better buy. Um, I'm not saying that that would work, but certainly um, if we know about it, we can take steps to try and help. Okay, I appreciate that. I think it, you know, it's, it's one of those complicated ones that, you know, potentially requires a lot of coordination and it's, it may be hard to make it work, but, you know, I appreciate that, you know, we can have to think about it and figure yeah. out if it makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions that people have? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Oh, Anita. There is a question emailed to me. Um, could you please tell me if the purchase of road bike counters to provide baseline and impact data for active transportation planning in our, municipal, in, in our municipality be considered? I can take that one. Thanks, Anita. Um, I think what we kind of landed on with respect to that is um, our Vision Zero grant program is not really designed to, you know, fund studies, engineering studies, or even something like that, a counter. But if you, let's say you they were implementing a measure alongside that, um, let's say you were um, implementing speed or speed radar board or something like that, um, and you, you know, had to do a study to measure that. It'd be part of your evaluation plan. It could be considered, but in all cases, we're looking at initiatives where there's actually a road safety thing that is being implemented. So not exclusively a study or, or a data counter alone. Thank you, Neil. Anita, were there any others that came in by chat or email? Well, it looks like most of them have been answered by Nadia. Thank you. Um, for those of you who weren't able to look at the chat, um, 
there's a question about when work has to be completed by and project activities and expenditures must be completed by March 31st, 2023. Um, there's another one uh, regarding limit to the number of grant applications submitted by one applicant and there's no limit. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank everybody for their attendance at this webinar. Um, certainly like to thank Neil, uh, Nadia and Joanne for their uh, presentations and their input. Um, I encourage all of you to uh, develop your proposals. Um, please be in touch with us at the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit if you have questions or concerns after this webinar. Um, that you'd like to discuss about the uh, program. There's a dedicated email address that's available at the um, Vision Zero Road Safety Grant link. And so please email us your questions. There are also resources available on that site that uh, address the frequently asked questions. But as I say, if you have something that's not uh, to your satisfaction there, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Um, this webinar that we have conducted has been recorded, and so it will be posted on the Vision Zero site for others who were not able to make it or for your review if you wish to take a look back. So with that, again, thank you, Neil, Nadia, Joanne, and thank you all for your time this afternoon. We really do look forward to your proposals, and we look forward to working with you in developing these uh, proposals and implementing the interventions for road safety in British Columbia. Thanks very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you everybody for your time today. Awesome, look, look so forward to the applications.